Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining this Dataversity webinar, Moving from a Relational Model to NoSQL, sponsored today by Couchbase. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights of questions via Twitter using hashtag Dataversity. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen for that feature. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speaker for today, Matthew Groves. Matthew is a guy who loves to code. It doesn't matter if it's um, Sharp, jQuery, or PHP. He'll submit pull requests for anything. He has been coding professionally ever since he wrote a quick basic point of sale app for his parents' pizza shop back in the 90s, and he currently works as a developer advocate for Couchbase. And with that, I will give the floor to Matthew to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Hello. Thank you, Shannon. Can you all hear me okay and see my screen okay? You if, you can, yeah, just, if, you, if you can't, just say so in the chat and we'll see what we can do. But uh, I vote that we all just go back listening to uh, Ella and, uh, and uh, Louis Armstrong for a while. That was really great. So thank you very much for, for hosting uh, Dataversity and Shannon. And uh, my name is Matt Groves. I, actually, that bio is a little outdated. My title now is Product Marketing Manager, but I'm still very much a developer-focused guy. I do still enjoy lots of coding, um, but I'm now working with a marketing team um, to try to, uh, you know, give a little bit more of a technical uh, view to, uh, to product marketing. So anyway, with that in mind, today's uh, objectives are we're going to uh, give an overview of uh, how we might think about migrating an a, uh, existing database to NoSQL, in our case, Couchbase. Um, but even if you don't plan to do that and you want to start with NoSQL on a greenfield project in the future, this will help you compare and contrast NoSQL with relational. So even if you're not migrating an application, you can still think about migrating you know, your next project and migrating your mindset and your skill set. So this will give you a sense of some of the technical issues and differences between the two. We're not going to get into really deep details here. I'm happy to discuss those with you. I'm a very technical-minded person. Happy to discuss those with you afterwards, but we're not going to get uh, too deeply into those uh, today. Um, yes, so this is the agenda. We're going to do a quick intro to NoSQL, quick intro to Couchbase, some of the migration options at a high level you have, uh, how you might then go from initial migration to optimizing, and then I'll show you a quick demo of some NoSQL in action. But again, we're not going to get too deep into that uh, today. All right, so in introduction to NoSQL. Uh, there are use cases where you need to track a lot of information. So for instance, uh, e-commerce. It's not just about tracking the purchase, it's also about tracking what went into that purchase. What items did a user view? Did they add to a cart? Did they remove from a cart? Did they do searches? Did they do reading and leaving reviews? They're asking questions, adding to wish lists, all these activities that go into sort of the one transaction at the end of all those activities. And that can be a huge amount of data. In other verticals, we see a similar thing. You know, in the supply chain is, a, is, a, is all the stuff that goes into building it before you're fulfilling uh, something as an employee, or IoT, all the things that you go into operating uh, the IoT device uh, and then uh, ultimately providing a service. And this can be a huge in, uh, amount of data. Sometimes it's called massively interactive enterprises. And the application requirements are dramatically different um, for these types of use cases. So you have your transactional database, the traditional relational database we're talking about, you also have an idea of an analytical database. This is for reporting or BI. You might use an ETL to uh, dump data in there every 24 hours, for instance. And NoSQL really overlaps these cases where scale and flexibility and high availability and performance can provide lower costs. So especially when it comes to storing those interactions, all those activities leading up to the end result transaction. And the first generation of first generations of NoSQL don't really have capabilities like joins or acid transactions, and they don't have SQL as a query language. So they don't fit every transactional use case out there. Despite that, historically, they've still been used for some of those use cases, 
where high performance and scale are really, really important. So places where you have a high level of interactions like microservices, uh, you know, large scale consumer facing websites, IoT, et cetera. But Couchbase now being a later generation, mature NoSQL database actually supports SQL, supports SQL with joins, not just joins, but the full SQL language and uh, supports asset transactions. So we're actually going to start to see a bit of a shift in the use cases that NoSQL can uh, deal with. And just to, again, a little technical detail here, NoSQL databases, we're talking about document databases uh, like Couchbase. They store data typically as JSON, not always, but most, most of the time as JSON. And this is different than relational databases because data can be much richer. You can store arrays and nested objects and arrays of nested objects, and sometimes they're called sub-documents. And so this is just a quick refresher slide on JSON. You know, you're probably familiar with this. You've at least heard of this. This is something that is a very, very common um, notation language uh, for, for data. But why JSON? For a distributed NoSQL database, a key trade-off is that each piece of data uh, needs to be independent to make distribution easier amongst all the machines in a cluster. Now, even though that data is independent, so it's not relational, it's not in a table, it still makes sense to put it into a useful format. Um, so why JSON then? Out of all the formats, why would we pick JSON? Well, I, I think the reason is JSON is widely supported by every language and platform that I can think of, and its use goes beyond databases. And of course, it comes from JavaScript. So chances are JSON is already being used widely in your applications and enterprise. And um, I, I, would, I would think it's fair to say that most developers are at least familiar with JSON, if not experts in JSON at this point. And this eye chart over here, just to drive home the point, is a list of, it might be hard for you to see over the stream, but it's a list of JSON parsing libraries by programming language. So it's widely supported by every technology out there. Uh, even you might be surprised some of these technologies on there that support JSON. So JSON is a very good format. That's why it's most commonly used for document databases. So let's look at a comparison here of tables versus document sets. This is just a really simple comparison. So on the left, we've got a user table and a product table. And on the right side, in our NoSQL database, we've got, instead of tables, we've got something called collections. Uh, so it's they're not exactly the same, but uh, you can kind of think of them as analogous. On the left, we have a table. Uh, each table has a number of rows of data. And so on the right, each collection has a number of documents. And so you can kind of, again, not a perfect comparison, but you can kind of equate a row of data to a document in a NoSQL database. Now, these aren't just naming differences, right? There's underlying differences in how these work. But for comparison purposes, if you're coming from a relational background, this is a good place to start. Uh, so you can kind of see the equivalence there between uh, the first row of the user table and that first document in the uh, user collection on the right. Now, just a small example here of the difference between uh, a relational and, and a non-relational database. On the left, every row in that product table there, that's the one on the bottom left, it must have a value. Every one of those tuples must have a value, even if it doesn't make sense to have a value. So a product catalog, quantity might not make sense. For instance, if you're storing a, a service or something in the product table, uh, it might not make sense to have a quantity. But since it's relational, we have to put something in that quantity field. So maybe it's a null, or I've seen before uh, maybe a magic number like zero or negative one, or who knows what else it could be. You've got to put some sort of value in there. On the document side, however, the quantity can just be flat out omitted. If quantity doesn't make sense for a product, we don't have to have quantity in there at all. Now, on the flip side of that, if I want to add a restock uh, value, for my product. Maybe uh, I need to restock something. Again, if it's if you're putting services in your product table, then restocking maybe doesn't make sense. But if I want to add a restock to certain things like the Blard nozzle or the Hepto shaft, I would need to add a column. And again, a value for every row in that column. Uh, so probably have to fill it up with nulls or negative ones or something like that, even if restocking makes no sense. Now on the document side, I can add a restock field to a single document in the collection if I want to, and it has no effect on the other documents in that collection. Now, this is just a small taste of the schema flexibility that is afforded by a document database. 
And this has made document databases a great choice for use cases like content management, catalogs, IoT, use cases where there's a lot of data and a lot of variation of data. Now, of course, there's a trade-off here. Uh, the schema is not enforced, at least not at the database level. So that's something you have to deal with as a, as a trade-off there, but uh, you can see that as a benefit or a, a trade-off. In many organizations, this can help with agility. So it's no longer, in some organizations, it's no longer an interdepartmental memo to get a feel added to the table. And therefore, you can free up DBAs to spend more time being proactive in the database administration instead of having to spend lots of time responding to requests for field changes. Um, uh, so that's just, again, a small example of uh, how it can help with agility, both technical and organizational. And one more small note before I keep going along here, this is an important one that gets asked a lot, so I figured I would talk about it, is JSON famously does not have a date time in it, uh, or a date type, I should say. Um, this is just a, this is a part of, a, of using JSON. There's no, there's no date type. So like many things in NoSQL, you've got lots of options. So here's just three examples here. We could sort as uh, ISO 8601, like a string. Uh, we could sort as an array with all those components broken out into individual uh, elements of the array. We could also store it as a, like a Unix uh, timestamp, like an epoch over there as a number. Now, among those three, of course, uh, again, it's going to be up to your use case, but the most efficient to store is going to be the, the epoch or the Unix timestamp because that's, that's a, a long or an integer. And the string is going to be a lot more bytes than that. But it really depends on what you're doing and how you're querying the data. And so you have options here when it comes to date. Now, certainly, um, the J JSON doesn't have a date type, but any sort of query language or interaction with your data should have a, a variety of uh, functions or options how to treat uh, various pieces of data as dates. So I could have a, a function that converts a string to an epoch or an epoch to a string, uh, compare dates and, and get a difference, things like that. So we may not be able to store a literal date type, but we can certainly uh, treat these fields as if they were dates. Okay. So that's a that's sort of an intro to NoSQL and document databases, and I want to dig into Couchbase here a little more specifically now. So this is a diagram of Couchbase, and uh, there's going to be a quiz on this at the end, so make sure to memorize every single one of these wedges. Uh, I'm just kidding about that, but uh, this is kind of how we like to represent Couchbase. There's that solid core in the middle that everything else in Couchbase has been built upon. And these are kind of the three principles of uh, what Couch how Couchbase is built and how you uh, work with it. So the top one is uh, developer agility and versatility. So we already talked about JSON. Certainly you can store uh, JSON data in Couchbase. Uh, it's a document database and adjust your uh, you know, schema in an agile way. And you can also use Couchbase as a plain key value store if you like or if you need to. So you can actually, it's a multi-model. You can do either of those. It's also what might call a multi-mode. So a Couchbase has a memory-first architecture. Um, and so uh, it's got a built-in cache, basically, is what I'm saying. And we also introduced the ACID uh, transaction capabilities this last year. And one other thing you can do with Couchbase is the core of it is, was built for operational workloads, but we've also added an analytics workload option to it as well. So you can use the same cluster to perform your operational uh, work and your, your BI uh, analysis analytic work on the same cluster, and the, the data gets shared and updated in real time. And uh, programmable as well, just making it uh, easy for developers to work with, so the schema flexibility, of course. Uh, Couchbase was really the first NoSQL database to introduce a full SQL implementation, which we'll see some later. That's called Nickel. And we've got plenty of uh, SDKs for the popular um, programming languages, so .NET, Java, Go, and Node, and Python, and what have you. Performance is an important consideration for Couchbase, so we're not just trying to rebuild um, you know, a relational database. Uh, we're trying to continue to have a uh, focus on performance. And so with that in mind, so the core is to have a, a scale out that's not going to be a hassle. It's a shared nothing architecture. Um, many parts of it are asynchronous um, and the architecture is elastic. Replication is built in, not only at the cluster layer, but between uh, clusters, between data centers. 
And so with those capabilities, we can have uh, something that's always on with high availability, it can be globally distributed with replication, and it can be also, you notice here the, the yellow wedge there, uh, we can have a mobile component. So we can go f all the way to the edge with an edge device or a mobile phone device and have a database running there that can synchronize more on that later. And it can be easy to manage. So all these wedges here can be managed independently with uh, workload isolation. They're not separate uh, components, but they are. Uh, they can be isolated within that same cluster. Uh, automatic cluster rebalancing, this is a really, really cool feature. So if you add more nodes, more computing power to your cluster, the rebalancing takes place automatically. You don't have to worry about hotspots or uh, configuring any sort of sharding or anything like that. Location and deployment agnostic, meaning you can you can deploy Couchbase anywhere you want to or need to. More on that later. Uh, that includes Kubernetes and a microservice. I like to think of Couchbase as the best of both worlds, NoSQL and relational. Um, so, for instance, these ones that are highlighted right here are the benefits you get from NoSQL. You know, a key value store, JSON documents. We've actually got a full text search engine that's uh, one of those. Um, components that you can uh, that's included with the cluster. Uh, memory first, uh, asynchronous architecture, and master list. So all those things that make uh, NoSQL attractive for large-scale deployments, a high availability, um, uh, easy, easy scaling deployments. We've also added SQL, uh, been there for a while, and we've just recently added asset transactions. Those are the kind of the best things from the relational world, and indexing as well to support the SQL queries. Uh, so that they are performant as uh, as uh, you can make them. Uh, you want those queries to, to run as fast as possible. I mentioned that it's uh, deployment agnostic, uh, also sometimes called cloud native. Uh, you can deploy Couchbase basically anywhere uh, and how you want to. So you can deploy in your own private cloud, your own data center. You can deploy it to bare metal, to VMs, to Kubernetes, however you want to in the public cloud on VMs or Kubernetes there. Um, and we've also introduced recently a fully managed DBAS, database as a service, and that's uh, managed by Couchbase. And right now the options with that are AWS and Azure. There's gonna be more to come, uh, more options to come there, but that, that's called Couchbase Cloud. And which one you choose is gonna be up to you. And the, the great benefit of this is you actually do a hybrid approach. You can with Couchbase's core replication and, and sync capabilities, you can run a hybrid. You can have a disaster recovery in your own data center and the main cluster in your cloud, or, or vice versa. I mentioned the mobile components, or, or sometimes called the edge these days. It's a, a device that uh, may be running completely offline in a low or no internet location or a place where internet's very expensive. And then when you uh, collect the data or uh, you know, browse the data, and you're in that location, when you get back to a location with internet that's more easily accessible, you can sync up the data when that data is available. So it's an offline first approach with the uh, with Couchbase Lite there and sync gateway to manage the synchronization. Of course, Couchbase Lite can run completely independently on its own, but of course, so using sync uh, will give you a lot of benefits if you want to keep the data in sync with other users or with your main data center. And synchronization across different data centers. Uh, this is a tool called XDCR built in the Couchbase. And again, it can include, it can include uh, your on-prem data centers, your cloud, or both. And these are active-active replicas. They can be used for data recovery. You can use some geofencing with them. You can just use them to reduce latency, to have data centers closer to your European customers, for instance. And this is a feature that's been in Couchbase for a long time. It's part of the core of Couchbase. But users uh, love it, and we continue to make it as flexible as we can. Uh, to support more and more use cases. Okay, so that's a quick note on Couchbase. So let's get into some of the uh, migration options. So let's say you're facing this problem right here, and I'm, I'm guessing at least some of you are, and that your relational database is working fine, but maybe there's something coming in the future where there's new demand, and you aren't sure if your relational database can handle that scale and or that scale might cost you a lot, and so you're looking at other options, like Couchbase, uh, for some or all your workflow. It doesn't have to be an all or nothing. It can be just part of your workflow, for instance. It's a very common situation. So the issues for you to consider uh, are pretty much the same with any sort of migration. 
um, how risky is this going to be? Uh, does our team have the skills or expertise to work with the new database or the new tool? What's it going to cost to do the migration efforts? And once we do the migration, is it going to be fast enough? And once it's migrated, can we scale? Uh, can we handle that increased scale? So with that in mind, here's a list of some of the most typical options for database migration. And this is kind of mapped to risk and effort, but of course there's also uh, other factors in here, like I mentioned cost and do we have the right skills? So number one is kind of the highest risk, highest effort. Just rewrite the whole darn thing. Just uh, drop the old system, uh, maybe a few pieces of it left over, but just build the whole thing over again. That's the riskiest and the most costly and the highest effort option. Number five down at the bottom is the lowest effort, lowest risk option, is we basically just try as best we can, make the best effort that we can to move our data as it is over to the new database and maybe uh, take our queries and our data access and move them over to the new database just as they are without having to do any sort of remapping or remodeling or anything like that and no optimizing either. And so then you can see as you, you, once you do number five, you can take a step up to the number four at that point. You can say, okay, we've actually got it moved over and it's working. Now, how can we take advantage of the unique capabilities of NoSQL to optimize it, to get it running faster and, and to refactor to work best with that new technology? In some cases, number five might be all you need. <laughs> uh, that would be a very uh, good situation. Uh, but you probably will need to go at least to number four at some points. Uh, it may not be the whole thing at once. Again, maybe just parts at a time. And we'll, we'll discuss that here uh, in a little bit more. So that's what I want to tackle first is the is migrating without denormalizing. So I mentioned that with JSON, you can have rich data structures. You can have nested objects. You can have arrays. We're going to basically take a first pass at migrating data without doing any of that, without taking advantage of any of those capabilities of JSON. Uh, and so. I like to use a kind of a, a paper shredder metaphor when I talk about relational databases because data is heavily normalized and then is joined together when necessary. So think of like a paper shredder. Let's say I fill out a tax form, which I'm working on already this year, filling out a tax form on a piece of paper. And you know, a tax form has all those different lines on it, uh, all those horizontal lines. So then I run it through a paper shredder and I take all those horizontal lines and I store those shreds in their own folders. So line five goes into the five folder, line six goes into the six folder, et cetera. And then when I want to look at or change the form, I go through each of those folders, pull out the shreds and line them up on my desk and I put the document back together. And that's kind of how I see a relational data store working is that I have all these different pieces that are split up and stored in multiple tables. Now in a, a Couchbase or a, a JSON database like Couchbase, you don't have to put them through the paper shredder uh, in fact, a document database is going to perform better by keeping all those shreds together and not shredding them in the first place. However, if we're looking at the easiest option and we're migrating from relational, it may be best to keep them in the normalized shredded state at least at the beginning and then optimize them as we need to uh, as the system goes forward. So we're going from a, from a, a record-centric sort of 2D paradigm to a document-centric um, model. But we're gonna start with just keeping it at that 2D paradigm that most developers and most uh, architects are already familiar with. So that also kind of helps solve the, do we have the skill for this uh, migration? So in a relational database, we, we saw this kind of earlier, you have a tables which contain rows, and Couchbase you have collections which contain documents. And so this is kind of the Google Translate version of uh, the migration process is we just take the one and uh, take a row and make it into a document, take a table and make it into a collection. So I have, instead of a user table, I have a user collection. And then instead of two rows, I have two documents. And I translate the data into JSON there and I have a relatively flat, simple JSON object. So uh, I can take the primary key of my relational table, which was blue one two three dash four in this case and i can make that the document key uh, of the uh of the, of the couch based document in this case so each document has its own unique key i mentioned you could use it as a key value store this is kind of the underlying uh structure is is key value but i have json in there as my value 
and all the values from the row, so age 42, name, and admin all go there into the document. I could also store a copy of the user ID inside the document if I want to. Do the same for the second row. Now we've got two documents in a collection. And so just a quick look at then what denormalizing would look like. So notice the shredded version on the left. This, is, this roughly corresponds with a single document on the right. So we've got uh, three tables and four pieces of data on the left. We've got one document, one piece of data on the right. Uh, and now by doing this, this makes horizontal scale easier because each piece of data is isolated. It's not beholden to a given table or schema, which means it can live on any, uh, any given server in our cluster. So this is how you might want to end up eventually. Um, to start with, you want to do a very simple translation of uh, you know, one row of order to one document and so on. But eventually you might want to get to the point where you have just a single document that contains an order that has all those different uh, pieces of data already embedded into it. In the long run, to improve performance, uh, once you've migrated those shreds over, you can start to selectively denormalize where it makes sense to. So some of those shreds, they might just stay as shreds indefinitely. Uh, so you can have your data storage, though, aligned directly with the object model in your application. And this is a problem known as impedance mismatch. So if you use a tool like Hibernate or Entity Framework or an ORM like that, you're probably familiar with this, with this kind of, that those tools are to help solve that problem of uh, tr translating denormalized data into an object for your application. Now, with your data being denormalized, you don't need to spend as much resources on joins and transactions. Although, again, just to reiterate, to put your mind at ease here, a NoSQL database, a mature one like Couchbase, supports both joins and transactions. And now, finally, storing denormalized data makes CRUD operations super, super quick, not to mention that Couchbase, again, has that built-in memory-first architecture. So those denormalized reads and writes will often be reading and writing to memory instead of waiting on disks and joins. We'll come back to this a bit more when we talk about optimizing. But even with your data denormalized, you still have the ability to write those SQL queries and indexes. So you get the flexibility either way. Now, speaking of SQL, I've, I've touched on this earlier. Let's take a look at what SQL queries look like in a relational database and what they look like in a Couchbase. So I've got kind of a, um, a SQL server example here on the left. Uh, kind of a pseudo example of SQL Server. This, this could easily be Oracle or Postgres or MySQL or whatever. Just kind of get the idea there. This is a query that returns a list of all the landmarks that are in the same cities as uh, major airports. So I have a, a subquery here, selecting everything from landmarks where the city is the same as the city in the airports table. And then I have the couch base query on the right which the syntax is largely the same here. So the main difference is that instead of selecting from a, in SQL Server it's called a catalog, and then you have a schema like DBO and a table. In Couchbase we have a bucket called travel, we have a, a scope, in this case I'm using the default scope, and a collection called landmark. Otherwise it's pretty much the exact same query, which again, this is gonna help you if you're trying to make that migration uh, in, in that uh, you already know how to write SQL. And so you can uh, just take the same exact approach with a you know, few tweaks, just like you would between any given two different SQL implementations. There are going to be some differences, but uh, you can be able to perform the same sorts of things in Couchbase with the nickel query language, N1QL. So roughly speaking, again, a table is like a collection. They aren't exactly alike, so a collection does not have a defined schema that it must adhere to. Uh, joins and everything you'd expect from SQL are here in Couchbase as well. So merge, CTEs, subqueries, unions, all that stuff is there. Um, other stuff. So this is why uh, we often refer to uh, it as SQL++. So it's SQL plus some extra capabilities to deal with JSON. So to deal with nested or embedded documents or arrays, things like that. And then indexes. As a SQL developer, I got to confess, I was often very lax about creating indexes. And I generally got away with it. But we're talking about distributed data now, multiple servers, and, and probably a lot of data. So indexes are very, very crucial 
And so the same sort of uh, indexing language you'll see uh, in SQL Server, you'll see in Couchbase as well. Uh, and so you can create an index here uh, on a given uh, collection or a given um, uh, set of documents. And um, there's lots of types of indexes. You can create functional indexes, partial indexes, covering indexes, and so on. Uh, there's even some flexible indexing options if you want to do a, a limited kind of ad hoc index as well. And GSI here is called Global Secondary Index. So this is this is an index that's stored separately from the data, which means it's it's more easy to it's, sorry it's more performance. Uh, to, to do that. You don't have to gather index from every node in your cluster. It's just gathering them from the one index service. And in, in some cases, a query may not even need to access the data directly. That's the covering index I'm talking about. So if you're selecting fields that are all indexed, you can just pull the data right from the index. You don't have to take the extra step of fetching the data. So this is very important when it comes to performance is, is getting the indexes right. Okay, so this, to sum up, these are the keys to success to consider when moving from relational to NoSQL is, uh, does your NoSQL database have those features that you need uh, to make the transition easy? So SQL, asset transactions and joins. Uh, do you understand uh, the, the mapping between tables and uh, bucket or tables and collections and schemas and scopes and databases and buckets? And uh, dealing with the SQL dialect transitions, that's going to be uh, something you'll have to learn about, like the name of the function for getting the difference between dates it might be slightly different than what you're used to. And then optimize later. Uh, so once you've got everything moved over and your queries all set up and they're working, then it's time to think about optimizing. So these are all the, the key considerations for optimizing. I, I, uh, okay, yes. Right, I thought, it was, I thought I had the wrong slide there. Um, so um, I think I did actually, I think I left that slide in by mistake. So joining and transacting is costly. Uh, even in the distributed architecture like Couchbase, joins and asset transactions still do uh, take, take a performance hit to do that. So you still have to consider uh, how many of those are you going to be able to support in there. And your, use your well-designed application code already as a guide. So if you're, if you're migrating an existing application, you can look at your entity framework, you can look at uh, Hibernate and say, okay, well, th can this help me uh, create an uh, optimized um, object in JSON? Uh, I, for instance, a person contains addresses, right? And you may want to merge addresses into the person document, but you may want to keep orders separate. If you're familiar with the idea of aggregate roots from domain-driven design, it's the same sort of concept here. So think in terms of entities. Uh, in the scope of your application, does this always have a life cycle outside of the thing that always references it? So just kind of on optimizing, think about can I reduce the number of transactions or joins re and joins required? Have I met my performance and scale requirements for that? So one way you can reduce joins and transactions, this is a hypothetical again, so we've got SQL Server on the left there, and we've got uh, a uh, Couchbase approach on the right there. Suppose a user has a checking account and a savings account. They're in two rows of data in this model. With the relational database, I have to transfer, to transfer between them, I have to have a transaction, because I have to update one and update the other. If, however, they were in the same row of data, you wouldn't have to have a transaction. You wouldn't have to invoke that overhead. However, in relational databases, that's not a flexible design at all. With a document approach, you could have, in my case here, I've got a nested object called balances. I could store them both in the same document and update them without a transaction and still have the flexibility of adding other accounts in there under balances. So think back to those five steps, right? So um, the first step, you might be starting your migration with two documents, um, but combining them into a single document, this is an example of optimization to reduce those joins and transaction pressure on your database. You can also analyze your logical model the best you can. So the key element of optimization here is to determine where and how you can consolidate your data. So take those shreds and put them into individual uh, larger pieces. So let's look at a diagram of a more complex sample here. We're thinking of entities or aggregate roots, like I mentioned with, with the domain-driven design. So maybe is the, uh, is the orange, uh, what I've highlighted in orange there, is that the object? 
Um, so in this model, orders contain items. So we can just switch to embedding items inside the order document if we want to. Or maybe we can group them together differently. We can embed pay type inside of order. And instead of embedding items, we can embed product into each item. So this is how it will look here. We would have an items array that contains an ID, and that ID points, points to the, uh, the various uh, items and products instead of nesting those within the order. So, but now the items and product are grouped together. So that makes them more efficient because they're now together in one piece of data. And another, so basically the consideration to make here is, is whether to use an array or nested object or even an array of objects. And the way you work with these two options can vary. So you need to know how to plan your, how you plan to access this data. Is there a defined sort order that you are, uh, that you are relying on? So if so, arrays might be the way to go. If you need to update each phone number on an individual basis, then nested might be more efficient. So I've got nested on the left and I've got array on the right there just to show you two different approaches. So we're coming up towards the, uh, towards the end here of the uh, presentation. We'll get to the demo, but um, this is kind of the uh, conclusion here is that uh, migrate first, optimize later. This is going to reduce risk. It's going to uh, increase your performance. Joins and multi-document transactions are going to be more costly. They're costly and relational. They're going to be more costly in distributed architecture. So a one-to-one -one migration that you start with might be slower um, until you get to optimize. So then you can start embedding documents as an optimization. Queries can be converted uh, as long as you notice the couch base and JSON differences. And transactions are available, but as you've seen from embedding, you may not need them as much. Uh, to meet your uh, scale performance goals. Uh, SQL queries can be converted, as I mentioned. This is not a, as onerous a process as you might think. Uh, Couchbase uh, SQL language called Nickel N1QL is uh, very much a standard SQL implementation. So you're, you're always going to have differences between, you know, for instance, Transact SQL and PL SQL and Postgres SQL and all those sorts of things. Same thing applies for Couchbase here. But I just wanted to show you this little graph here on the right. Uh, this is just based on user surveys. It's, it, you know, Nickel, Couchbase's SQL lang language is the top feature why users prefer Couchbase over a database like Mongo, for instance, where converting those queries from relational is not going to be as straightforward, uh, and or you're going to be learning an entirely new language, and that's more time-consuming and more risky to do that. Okay, I want to switch over to a quick Couchbase demo here. I've got uh, Couchbase running on my machine here locally. Let me know if that is not legible. Uh, I tested this out earlier, but I just want to make sure. Everybody see that okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring in a sample bucket. By the way, this is Couchbase Server 7. This is currently in beta, but I wanted to show you some of those collection features that are currently in Couchbase Beta 7. So I'm going to load in uh, a travel sample data set. This ships with Couchbase. It's includes travel data uh, into this travel sample bucket. Uh, and uh, so uh, let's see. This is analogous to like the database or uh, SQL Server, we call them catalogs. Uh, it, again, it's analogous, but it's not a relational database. And just by creating this bucket, you're getting all the scaling and high availability and flexibility that NoSQL typically provides. And you're going to get some of the familiar elements you know from the relational world. So let's dig into this travel sample. I think it's all loaded now. I'll click here at Scopes and Collections. So I want to show you that we've got two different scopes here. We've got a default scope, inventory scope. You can create you know, a lot of scopes here. A scope can be used for if you want to isolate data to a microservice, for instance. If I have an inventory microservice, I might have a, a payment processing microservice. There might be two different scopes, for instance. Or I could use this as a multi-tenancy approach. I could have Customer one could be this scope. Customer two would be the second scope, et cetera. And um, because there, we have these scopes, we can also uh, assign security roles and permissions to these scopes. So you can give a given user permission to just a scope or read only or, or permission to just a scope, things like that. This is kind of analogous to the, to the schema level in SQL Server. I'm not sure what they would be called in, in other relational databases, but that's kind of where that is there. I can click on uh, this, and I'll see a list of collections. 
So you can see in this one, we've just got the five collections of airlines, airports, hotel, landmark, and routes. And these are kind of analogous to tables. So inside this airline collection are, um, are just documents for airlines. And then inside the airport collection, there's documents for airports. Uh, so again, it's kind of analogous to tables. Um, I can also, let's see, let's go, just go into one of these, uh, let's see, we're going to go to routes, I think. Click on documents here. And these are all the individual routes that are inside that collection. So we've got travel sample, inventory, scope, and then the route collection. And these are all the route documents. So I can actually show you one of these. Let's edit it and show you that it is uh, JSON in there. Um, you can see uh, this is an array of objects in there for the route. Uh, and these are all the other uh, fields and values for the JSON object. And that's, those are all the routes. Uh, I want to also want to take you quickly to indexes. So I can view these indexes by bucket. I'm not going to get into this too much, but you can see there's lots of indexes here created for the airline. So for instance, this is an index on the airport collection, uh, just on the airport name field. So I can create other indexes that are on multiple fields. Uh, this one here is on, this is a much more complex uh, index on source, destination, and then uh, the schedule array in there as well. So all kinds of indexes you can create there. You need the indexes for the next step, which is going to be the querying. So I want to show you, I'm just going to copy and paste here quickly, a SQL query. And this is, uh, again, this is called a nickel. N1QL is the language in Couchbase, but refer to it as SQL. So I'm going to select everything from this uh, route collection where the source airport is CMH. That's my home airport of Columbus, Ohio. So execute that. And I will get uh, 63 results back here. Uh, might be hard for you to see. Let me see if I can uh, zoom in a little bit here. You see 63 documents there in the results. And that's, that's the query there. And the results down here are in JSON. Uh, now I could put them in a table view. It's still JSON behind the scenes, but I can at least view them like a table, which sometimes works well, sometimes not so much. It's a little awkward here because we've kind of got a table inside of a table with this schedule, but it's ultimately just JSON there. And I want to show you a join. So notice here I've got this uh, airline ID that says, okay, this route corresponds to this given airline. But showing a customer airline 321 doesn't really give much information. So I want to do a join here to the airline uh, the airline collection to get the name of the airline. So I'm going to do just to paste this in here to, uh, just to save some time typing with the airline ID, source airport, destination airport, and I'm going to join the route to the airline on the airline ID. And this is this syntax here is basically just saying give me the give me the ID, the key of that document, and pull the airline name from that document. So execute that. And you can see now I've got uh, the airline name in addition to the airline ID. So now I know that this is Delta uh, and so on down there. I can also put this in table here. This looks a little cleaner in table because it's all just flat data now. But there you go. So there's a there's a uh, relatively simple join in Couchbase. It can get a lot more complex, of course, with uh, with SQL, just as you know as you need it to. But just keep in mind that indexes are very important, so you might want to look at index advisor and might say, here's the index I'm currently using and here's some recommendations. So a covering recommendation, this would be if you want to index all those fields. So you can skip, for instance, the uh, the fetch step of the of the query. I'm getting a little bit too deep into the weeds here, but I just I just think that stuff's so cool. So um, that's uh, that's all I want to show you with the demo there. Happy to come back to this if some of the questions call for it. One more thing I'd like to mention, this is a relatively new offering for us, but it's, it's very exciting. It's the uh, Couchbase Cloud, DBAS. You can go check it out. It's a fully managed database as a service, couchbase.com slash product slash cloud. We just announced last week, I believe, uh, full public availability of running Couchbase Cloud on Azure. So we have AWS and Azure and more of those to come in the future. But you can go check it out. I think there's a free trial running right now. There's some promotions for getting you know, cloud credits, things like that. So I'm going to check that out if you're interested in exploring that some more. But again, you can also just download it and run it on your local machine like I've been doing for this demo. So lots of ways you can deploy and, and try out Couchbase.
Okay, uh, I think that's going to be it for uh, what I have prepared. I'm happy to answer some of these questions. I don't know if you wanted to yeah. ask them, Shannon, or? Yeah, yeah, let me jump in here. And thank you for this great presentation. There's a lot of questions coming in. If you have questions for Matthew, feel free to submit them in the Q&A portion in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Um, so diving in here, how do you how to respond to NDR4 optimize when this is a performance ticket, a client screens not responding? How to respond to NBR4 optimize when this is okay? You're talking about the um, the level, um, the, the I think the the, um, the one to one to five rating I was talking about. Let me just roll back here to that slide, That's right here. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. How to respond to that when a when a, when a uh, performance ticket, right? So, uh, I mean, that's really you. Ha you have to know that going in is after this migration, is it going to meet the performance needs that I have? Um, I, you know, if it's gotten to the point where the client is is screaming at you, that may have gone a little bit too far uh, in your in your process without without doing some some proper uh, testing and, and optimization there. Um, I would say at the number five level is. You know that that how to respond to that is well. Um, it really depends on who your customer is, what the use case is. But the response is we decided to do this migration. Um, you know, to for whatever reason, to save costs or to, um, you know, just it's going to be a temporary thing until we can get get optimized. You may not even want to go into production with the number five level. You may want to just try that out as a proof of concept, and and get people to try it, and then they can scream at you there. And that's fine because it's not affecting your end user just yet. Uh, it may be affecting some beta users or alpha users. So uh, that's that's how I guess I would would go with that. Um, you don't don't let it get to the point where the client uh, is screaming at you. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Uh, so is it up to the programmer to handle potential CRUD anomalies like deleting all copies of a customer in the uh, denormalized document version of the data? Um, I would so in a, in a document database, typically you don't have something like a, a foreign um, foreign key constraints, and you don't have uh, you know so if you if you delete you could delete a, a document and still have a reference to it elsewhere. So I would say that uh, it could be up to the, to the programmer, depending on which programmer you mean, right? It could be up to the DBA. There are some options in Couchbase, for instance, to um, to program what's called a Couchbase event or a Couchbase function, which will respond to documents being updated or deleted. And so you can, at that point, you can say, okay, this document's been deleted, so go ahead and delete these other related documents as well. You know, I, I think a lot of the applications that I've seen don't really do a hard delete of data anymore. They'll, they'll, they'll do a soft delete and flag the data as this is deleted or, you know, deleted equals true, something like that. So. You don't still have to worry about doing a, a actual delete of all the data, and maybe you can soft delete it and expire it after a certain period of time or something. So, Matthew, is the joins and asset support a final reason to replace transactional uh, databases? <laughs> you know, as an employee of a, of a company who uh, makes a, uh, a NoSQL non-relational database, I'd say yes, of course. But <laughs> no, uh, I would say you know, if if you're running into those problems with scale and performance and it's, it comes down to, you know, uh, we, we, it's hard to scale out a, a traditional relational database or uh, these joins are slowing down our query too much, um, maybe we can try another approach with non-relational. Uh, yes, then I think it, it would be a good reason to look into it. Uh, I, would, I don't think I, I, would, I would say with, within any reason that relational databases are going away. Uh, and this is going to be the death of relational databases. No, I don't. I don't think so at all. If that's what you're asking. So, uh, what is Couchbase document memory size limit? For example, how big a document can be maintained in memory? Yeah. So, with Couchbase, the the memory limit is basically a per bucket, per node quota, right? So, if I have, if I say, oh, give uh, one gig of RAM to Couchbase, and I have five nodes, that's five gig of RAM that uh, my whole cluster has, right? Uh, and, you know, you can you can give as much RAM as you want to um, per, per node. Now, the document size in Couchbase is limited to, I think, 20 meg, um, which is kind of a reasonable limit for just the replication reasons. If you get 
much larger than that, you could end up with some very um, very heavy traffic between nodes for replication purposes. So that's the limit that's been set, 20 megabytes at, at Couchbase. And can we create actual physical tables using the uh, N1QL? Um, there will be a lot of business users uh, used to accessing tables using BI tools. How can they access uh, Couchbase? Yes. So um, it depends on what BI tools you're talking about. If if your uh, if your business users are writing SQL still, so you're using for instance Power BI or some other tool like that, you can still there there are uh, JDBC and ODBC drivers available for Couchbase. Uh, so you could you could use those. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, one of the wedges there at the beginning, Couchbase has its own analytics uh, service built in as well, which also works with SQL. So uh, again, it's, it's not it's not going to be tables, but it's still going to be SQL that they can use to write those queries. Um, so th those are both good options there uh, for reporting BI analysis. Um, yeah, so o ODBC, JDBC, and uh, Couchbase Analytics is, I guess, the short version of my answer. So does Couchbase support any sort of join between two different JSON document collections? Yeah, yes, any sort of join. Uh, well, do you have a particular join in mind? Because uh, certainly I, I, I've shown an inner join already, and you could do a left join. Um, I, I mean, you can do joins on multiple fields um, if there's another specific kind of join. But, but yeah, the short answer is yes. You can join between collections, between buckets, between scopes, any anything like that, assuming you have permission, your user has permission to do that. Sure, and you, and you mentioned Azure and AWS as the cloud environments. What is the operating what's the operating system of this database optimized to run? Uh, optimized to run. So uh, I don't want to get into any operating system wars here, but Couchbase uh, is supports uh, Windows, um, uh, many Linux distributions, and I think uh, for developers it also supports Mac and and uh, and Windows desktop. Um, not not a production environment, certainly a development environment. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I think most of our customers are probably on Linux, but I think many are using Windows, Win, or Windows Server. I mean, and we also we also I don't know if I mentioned this very mentioned this uh, or not, but certainly uh, Kubernetes uh, and containers, Docker containers are available for Couchbase as well. And there's been a lot of questions along those lines about comparing uh, Couchbase to other NoSQL databases, sure. but we are a vendor neutral um, <laughs> spot, so we do ask you to keep it. So just, I just to let everybody know, I'm not going to be asking those questions, so we can keep it to that. <laughs> you're, 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 you're certainly welcome to contact me afterwards if you want to discuss that. Happy to discuss <laughs> those. <laughs> so what is an entity framework to you? So I... I, I may have mentioned Entity Framework during the presentation. It, Entity Framework I was talking about was specifically a Microsoft .NET technology. It's an ORM, uh, similar to Hibernate, if you're familiar with Java, or, uh, you know, I don't know, I, I think like Laravel has uh, an, has an ORM built in. So that's that's what, uh, when I was saying Entity Framework, that's what I was referring to. And does Couchbase support traditional foreign key constraints to support referential integrity between data sets? So there is no foreign key constraints. That would, this is sort of what I was referring to back when I said we're not just trying to rebuild a relational database. Um, you know, foreign key constraints makes the scaling a little more challenging to do. So there is, there is nothing like that in, in Couchbase right now. It does support joins, right, between fields, but, but not, a, uh, not a foreign key constraint. I don't, and in fact, I don't think, uh, I can't think of any document database that does support that. And uh, any possibility in future to add Couchbase NoSQL as a flexible platform added as a layer on top of a, rel a relational databases based applications? Uh, can you say that one more time? Yes. Um, any possibility in future to add Couchbase NoSQL as a flexible platform added as a layer on top of RDBMS-based applications, in the acronym. Hmm. Uh, I'm not sure what that would look like. A NoSQL as a flexible platform on top of relational-based applications. That would be – I don't know how that would work. Um, I, I will say that I think 
I don't want to get too inside baseball here, but I think Couchbase Lite, which is the mobile offering for Couchbase, I mentioned that briefly, I believe that uses um, sort of, well, for Android and, and iOS anyway, it uses the um, the databases provided by those devices behind the scenes. But that that is not, that's not what I'm talking about with Couchbase Server. So Couchbase Server would be, uh, I don't I don't think you would add another layer on top of relational um, relational database. Now, if if the question here is more along the lines of can can I you know split out part of my application to use Couchbase as a backend and keep the rest on relational? Absolutely, especially in a microservice architecture, that makes a lot of sense. And that's what a lot of our customers are doing. So, a part of their system is you know really struggling under the load under the scale like a user profile or a catalog, for instance, and it makes sense to leave the rest, the parts that aren't struggling, in relational and move just that part to Couchbase. That makes total sense to me. But as in terms of a technical layer on top of relational, I don't I don't think that uh, I don't think that tracks. All right, lots of great questions coming in here. So you know, is there something like a uh, row level security? Uh, Row level security. Um, the, the lowest level of security that Couchbase 7 has right now, I think, is collection level security. Now, I will say there are some at the SDK level, so if you're using Java or .NET or whatever, there are some encryption options available at the, uh, again, like you're saying, in row level in quotes will be the document level in Couchbase. There are some ways to encrypt specific fields. Um, but there's nothing right now that I think you can say for for this given row only, uh, you know, only has that uh, this user only has access to this subset of rows, for instance. So the best way to do that would be to create a separate collection, I think, and assign permissions to that collection. And I think we have time for a couple more questions here. Um, any other integration best practices to adopt for uh, ServiceNow or? Uh, Broadcom monitoring tools. I'm, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not familiar with ServiceNow or Broadcom uh, monitoring tools. I think um, the, the, the last thing I saw with monitoring the Couchbase had to do with Prometheus. So, as a Prometheus provider for Couchbase that's out there, I think there's some integrations for some of the more popular monitoring tools. Uh, I don't. I don't know if I'm stepping into uh, you know vendor territory here, but uh, there are some there are some uh, monitoring tools out there. I don't know about those tools specifically. I have to. I'll make a note to myself, look that up. Sure. And can you speak to any known healthcare implementations um, with fast healthcare interoperability resources? You're talking about FHIR, FHIR, yes. So uh, there's actually a blog post on Couchbase. I think we have at least one customer who has implemented FHIR, and you can go check out some of, I don't know if this mentions a customer specifically, but it certainly shows the implementation of, of FHIR. Couchbase is ideal for that. FHIR is a JSON-based. Um, healthcare, kind of—I uh, don't know if I'd describe it as a schema, but but kind of a um, a, a way to represent data in JSON for uh, for like you said interoperability uh, with the healthcare providers. So yes, Couchbase is very involved in that. Uh, definitely, you want to—I don't think I have the URL on me right now, but certainly if you just Google Couchbase Fire, that'll be the first result for you there. All right, and uh, I think we can squeeze this in pretty quickly. Does Couchbase Lite sure. use SQLite? Uh, so I, 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 I stopped short of saying that earlier, but I, I, I think uh, it depends on the operating system. So I, I think it does use it behind the scenes, uh, at least on Android. I'm not sure about uh, other uh, operating systems. But uh, it's not something where you would want to actually go into the SQLite directly. It would... It would that would be uh, you know a potential for causing corruption things like that. Okay, I'm going to keep squeezing in some questions here, Matthew. <laughs> okay. so we've got a couple of minutes, two minutes left. <laughs> Is there any data masking ability? Um, well, yeah, right. I, I, so I think with uh, if masking you mean like encryption of uh, individual pieces of data. Yeah, I mentioned there's some client side options for that. I know at least .NET and Java, and maybe a few other SDKs that can support that. Um, and certainly, in terms of a, a larger, like uh, encrypting data at rest, for instance, um, there are some. Well, certainly, uh, data in motion is, is encrypted with Couchbase. So if you're querying, it's all over TLS, things like that. 
But data at rest, I believe we, we have uh, several partners, I believe, and certainly the cloud options as well will do some of that for you if you're interested in encrypting the entire data set uh, at rest. I love it. Well, Matthew, thank you so much for this great Q&A and for the presentation. And uh, thanks to Catchface for sponsoring. We always uh, love it when you guys join us. Uh, and thanks to all of our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do, but that is all the time that we have um, for today's presentation. Uh, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email to everybody by end of day Thursday with links to the slides, the recording of this presentation as well as uh, how to get more information from Couchbase. Matthew, thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Hope you all have a great day and stay safe out there. Thank you, Shannon. Thanks, everybody, for coming.